Monday morning. I'm Glenna Milberg. What may be the speediest session in Florida history gaveled in this week with some big change. Change making bills already headed for the House and Senate floors. Some have wide bipartisan support and some are beyond contentious along party lines. During the Sundays of session, we'll bring you as many South Florida lawmakers as we can to talk about all of it. We start this hour with the bill filed literally minutes after the House and Senate gaveled in on Tuesday that answered the question of will they or won't they? Bills to restrict pregnancy terminations even further that also adds exceptions and mandates. We did invite the rep and the senator who filed the bills to join us. We did not hear from them. West End Democrat Robin Bartleman was one of the lawmakers who has shared very publicly her family's personal experience as an example of what to consider. And the rep joins us now this morning. Robin Bartleman, great to have you back on the program. Good morning. I'm happy to be back here, Glenna. Thank you for having me. Of course. So this bill is entitled Pregnancy and Parental Support. And there is in the bill a lot of money and a lot of uh, wellness counseling, mental health counseling, um, pregnancy counseling, uh, even even employment counseling for pregnant women. Um, and it also does shorten the legal termination deadline from 15 weeks, which actually is now in the courts from last session, to six weeks. And and your story that you told last year on the on the floor of the House um, that that really brought the place to tears is really a story of timeline. And I wonder if you would just, you know, fill, fill in our viewers on what you went through. So I uh, had a much wanted pregnancy, a pregnancy that I even had infertility treatments to get. And uh, along the way, we uh, through a high level ultrasound, it was noticed that the fetus was uh, abnormal and that there were serious uh, issues with the fetus, the shape, the size. And so I was told, you know, you need to make a decision about whether or not you're going to terminate this pregnancy. And it was uh, the toughest decision uh, I was ever faced with in my life because contrary to proper uh, popular belief, many people work really hard to get pregnant like I did and really, you know, want to have a healthy baby at the end of that pregnancy. So it was, and I was a special ed teacher, so it made it even more difficult. So uh, my husband and I, we got legal pads. We went through the pros and cons, the quality of life of the uh, future baby. And uh, honestly, it was a painstaking decision that should only involve me, the mother, my husband, my doctor, and my God. So the um... And what the state of Florida has done is they put Governor DeSantis and the legislature in that exam room and in those personal conversations. So, you, you know, we, we've talked about this before. This debate has been ongoing for the last couple of sessions um, here and across the country. This is one of those issues where there's really no daylight between people's perspectives, especially when people come from a faith-based pers uh, perspective of, of taking a life. And there's been talk and debate and tears and arguments and really nobody changes their position. And, and I thought what was really telling about your story is the timeline of, for instance, an amniocentesis, which is really the first time that you can get a sense of the DNA of the fetus, can't happen until when, like? Um, until after the 15 week ban. So the current law yeah. as it stands now, you only have 15 weeks with no exceptions for rape or incest. You can't get an amnio until 16 weeks, and it takes about a week to get that amnio and the results. And you don't have a body scan of the fetus until 20 weeks, usually. So point so, being, you so, don't know about the, if there are any fatal, no. um, fatal fetal defects, is I guess the scientific term for it, until after what would be Florida's deadline New. for a legal termination. Correct, and the current bill, which is important to discuss today, is that you're not even going to know you're pregnant and you've missed the timeline. Well, let, because, me, um, let, let me just give you some statistics from, and our viewers, some statistics from the CDC, because last year when we were talking about this, 96% of Florida's um, terminated pregnancies, 96% occur prior to the 15-week mark, which we're now at. 
um, that goes down to 74 and change. So figure three out of four, three out of four current pregnancy terminations occur prior to the six weeks. So, you know, if, if you're one of those women who's outside that time frame, you know, that's a whole different story. But as far as public policy and the numbers go, we're talking about a very small number of Florida terminations. A woman should have a right to make decisions about her reproductive health. And Governor Rick Scott just came out against the six week abortion ban. He came out uh, just recently, a day or two ago. So when you say it's got, you know, it's a bipartisan, we're split. Six weeks is basically an outright ban. We've seen it in Texas. We've seen it in other states. For for the men out there, just how this works for women, and I'll, I'll give you too much information. You're supposed to get your period every four weeks. I don't get my period every four weeks. Sometimes I get it four and a half weeks. Sometimes I get it five weeks. Sometimes you don't notice. And so let me just go over this timeline. You find out you've missed your period, you're five, six weeks out, right, from your last period, not knowing when you got pregnant. It could have been the day after your last period. Then you have to, if you are able to, take time off of work or get a day off, right? Go to an abortion clinic. If you can get an appointment, because our abortion clinics are packed right now, because all the states around us have a six week ban. So everyone is coming from other states to Florida to get that abortion. Then I go in and I get that appointment, which is incredibly traumatic. I sit down with the doctor and he's gonna tell me, oh, the state of Florida says you have to wait 24 hours. So then I have to wait another 24 hours. This is going to push many, many women out of the timeline. That's why you see the influx of people coming from other states here because the six week abortion ban is an outright ban basically. You see doctors leaving the state of Texas, uh, abortion doctors. You, There are so many, the data, everything shows that the six week abortion ban is a huge problem. And it'll be and, interesting to, yeah. to see with all of, of the arguments that you and your colleagues make, if that does move the needle because you know, frankly it hasn't, with those people who are just dead set against what they consider to be taking of a human life. Let me let me just ask you one more question with the short time we have. This uh -huh. bill does something that the last bill did not, and it does add those exceptions for victims of crime like race, uh, rapes, and incest. Um, there, That was actually an amendment that was floated last time that was voted down, and there were some of your Republican colleagues who did vote for that amendment, and this time it's actually in the bill with some mandates for proof. Does, does okay, that, so, what changed so that that's now in the bill? I think what, they're, what they have is so inappropriate if you know anything about sexual assault victims. They didn't consult with any sexual assault victim uh, advocates or, or counsels. People know that only two out of 10 women even report a sexual assault, two out of 10. So that means eight women will not share because it is humiliating. They are afraid of being outed. They are re-traumatized. I'm floating two bills right now, this session, to protect sexual assault victims and one of them to protect their anonymity. So women do not go get those police reports. They do not go get the documentation that you need to have an abortion, which is what it requires. You are re-traumatizing these women. You're, I, I get, I, I suffer a brutal rape and then only two women are brave enough to even go to the police to get a report done. And now I'm going to be faced with dealing with that trauma, dealing with everything going on with my body. And then, oh my goodness, I have to get a whole bunch of paperwork so I can, so I can terminate this pregnancy that's the result of a sexual assault. That's, that's not, that's not what happens. That's not real life. This bill does not reflect real life. It doesn't affect the real life of what's happening to rape victims. It doesn't uh, reflect what happens to women and when they realize they're pregnant or not pregnant and when they get their periods. This is an outright abortion ban. And we were on this program in February of 2022 and the legislature spoke in six hours of debate and in every committee that 15 weeks was a fair mark, they, they gave numerous arguments as to why the 15 week abortion ban was the way to go. And you asked me at the end of that program, do you think this is going to lead to an outright ban? And absolutely it has. Robin Everything Bartleman said, giving us- uh, Not true. 
State Rep Robin Bartleman giving us a small taste of what we are going to hear in debate on, on both sides, very passionate debate. And I hope you will be back and we absolutely will be watching. Thanks so absolutely. much. Absolutely, thank you. If you hear the word tort and you think of dessert, sorry to say that is not what we're talking about next. The bill that takes on lawyers and lawsuits is and what it does and what it costs. The push and pull between Florida's insurers and the attorneys who sue them on your behalf is at the heart of a bill sailing through committees. The yeas think it'll bring balance and fairness to the lawsuit filing industry. The nays call it a gift to insurance companies. Miami Lakes Republican Tom Fabricio is the House sponsor of that bill and it's called Civil Remedies. Representative Fabricio, Tom, great to have you. Thank you, Glenda. Thank you for having me. We should, I, you know, I, I don't want to take all the credit for it. I am a co-sponsor of the bill in the House with uh, Chairman Tommy Gregory, uh, who uh, has been working very ardently on this bill as well. Okay, well, we are all about spreading the love, so thank you for that. And, you know, fair to say that in the House and Senate, a lot of people are in in the pot doing a lot of things. But you know, it was really interesting when I first read this bill on the website, you see the list of lobbyists that are registered. So you know there's a lot of money involved because that's a pretty long list of lobbyists involved in, in crafting this and, and speaking on this. Um, so is it fair to say that this bill sort of puts the guardrails on attorney's fees and the costs of litigation um, that attorneys file against insurers and insurance companies. So is, is guardrails, is that a, a kind of a valid headline? So the, the bill does a lot of things. It has, it has uh, I think, more than nine sections at this time, uh, the version that's going to be going into the Senate uh, come next week. Um, attorney's fees is one of them. And, uh, what, and we have worked, by the way, we've worked with both sides. Uh, the the FJA the trial bar has been working with us to to seek a, to seek a movement on the bill and it has moved uh, with regard to their request so we have worked with the trial lawyers and with regard to attorneys fees there is a section in the bill that says very clearly and we're working to make sure that the language is as clear as it possibly can be that if any insurance claim is wrongfully denied the insured will be able to have a lawyer obtain a their own attorney's fees if that lawyer prevails through a declaratory judgment action. So what that does is it kind of narrows in, but it, it, pro it provides for that cause of action. Whenever you have a, a, an insurance carrier that wrongfully dies, denies a claim, that claim uh, needs to be paid. And the, the, the party seeking payment, the insured should be able to get their attorney's fees um, if they do prevail on that. So there's a, some, compo okay, um, fair enough. And that was, it, that is a very easy explanation to understand. Um, there are components of the bill, for instance, one that talks about uh, ba bad faith, to get to a bad faith, not necessarily negligence. It has to go beyond that. So I think the concern that I'm hearing is when you say if an insurance company uh, wrongfully denies a claim, how that's kind of a gray area who decides and how whether that's wrongfully denied where, where so, does the weight so, lie so glenda these are two so glenda these are two different sections of the bill one section of the bill has to do with the one-way attorney's fees and that's what i just discussed where the where the attorney would be able to file or the insured would be able to file through their attorney a declaratory judgment action to declare whether the claim is covered or not that's an insurance coverage declaratory judgment action with regard to bad faith, that's a statutory cause of action. And what we're saying there is that there should be a, an amount of time between the time that the claim is filed and the time that a carrier has to pay the claim. So that has to do with the amount of time uh, that a carrier has to pay the claim. And what we're saying, the last version of the of the bill, uh, which may be changing before it gets to the Senate now, uh, the last version of the bill, I believe, said that there was 120 days between the time that a claim was filed and the time that a carrier had to pay that claim. And if that carrier paid that claim within that amount of time, there would be no liability to the carrier in bad faith because they did what they contractually had to do, which is pay the claim. And look, Glenna, the overarching idea here is twofold. 
Um, number one, we need balance. We have a huge amount of litigation in Florida, which tends to be gotcha litigation, and it's problematic. Uh, we have 8% of the, of the claims in the country, and we have 80% of the litigation for the entire country. So that's a huge amount here in Florida, so we're looking to balance it. However, the most important part of all of this is that all proper claims must be paid. Uh, if, if an insured pays a premium and has a contract, an insurance contract for coverage, if there is a covered claim, that claim must be paid and it must be paid in a timely way. I remember that statistic when the just a few months ago during special session, you were framing something along these lines to, to for specifically for windstorm coverage and new roofs and that kind of thing. And this kind of takes it to to insurance for medical and, and for everything else. And so you had at the committee meeting this week, one of the committee meetings, you had a lot of people who called themselves victims of medical tragedies who were really concerned about not being able to have fair representation in front of insurance companies. D do they have a valid concern there? That issue has been addressed. And I, as I mentioned, their concern was a couple, they had a couple of issues. One had to do with the one-way attorney's fees. And we've discussed that already here uh, with regard to what we've done as far as the declaratory judgment actions for wrongfully denied claims. The other has to do with a section of the bill uh, described as transparency and damages. The issue with transparency and damages has to do with currently in injury litigation. That means when there's a motor vehicle accident or a slip and fall, uh, any kind of injury in litigation, uh, that injury currently, oftentimes, uh, those injured parties receive treatment under what's called the letter of protection. Sometimes the injured parties have their own health insurance, yet they opt to not use their health insurance and they use these letters of protection. The letters of protection uh, sometimes are grossly in excess, the, the, meaning the, the medical cost that's attached to that letter of protection oftentimes is grossly in excess of what generally is customarily paid for those same procedures. So the with transparency and damages, those letters of protection will continue to be able to come into evidence uh, to show what that letter of protection doctor is charging via that letter of protection. However, what the bill does is it allows the actual the actual real cost of what those procedures generally and customarily cost also be presented to the jury so that the jury gets to evaluate. However, it's up to the jury ultimately, and that that's that has to do with medical costs. Uh, but it should be noted, and, and it, this has been confused a little bit, unfortunately, that nothing in this bill deals with non-economic damages such as pain and suffering. So a jury, a, a plaintiff's attorney will be able to continue to argue whatever amounts that they want to argue for future pain and suffering and past pain and suffering, and they will be able to, and the juries will not be, lim they, they're not going to hear anything additional. As a matter of fact, it should be also noted, we're not capping what the damages the jury can give in any which way. All we're saying is that the jury should be able to see what the customary and usual medical billing practices are for these cases so and it's for these types of treatments. It's, a trans it's almost a transparency issue. That's right. That's exactly right. Representative Tom Fabricio, you know we could talk about this for the next eight hours. It's a, a pretty complicated bill, but I sure do appreciate you coming on and giving us the headlines. It is very controversial with our attorney friends, and we'll be watching it go through the legislature. Thanks so much. Thank you, Glenna. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thanks. Next, locked and loaded the bill that would end the need for permits to carry a concealed firearm that's also now filled with money for school security. Just week one and one of this session's more controversial bills is already headed to the full House and Senate. It was first filed as permitless carry and is now titled public safety. It eliminates the permit currently required to carry a concealed firearm and it also now allocates for millions in security in schools. That is not enough for some of the Stoneman Douglas families at this event yesterday. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act passed three short weeks after the tragedy here in Parkland. That law got it right, and I fear that this current bill will retract some of that. And we will have more families joining the terrible club. <coughs> my wife and myself and the other families here today find ourselves in. 
Coral Springs Democrat Rep. Dan Daly was at that meeting and right here with us today. Dan, great to see you. Hi, Glenna. Thanks so much for having me. So we'll get into the bill and the details in um, in just a little bit. I just since we're coming off that that uh, some sound from Tony Montalto, what would this bill have? At, what kind of effect, if if any, would this bill have had on the catastrophe at Stoneman Douglas five years ago? So the permitless carry bill um, that that the Republicans in Tallahassee are teeing up for passage um, would not have had a, a, an impact necessarily on MSD. I think it just makes it more likely that there are other uh, events like the tragedy at, at MSD. Right. We're opening the floodgates and letting folks do um, have those firearms uh, on their person. So the um, the bill has morphed. We watched the last committee meeting in the Senate this week. Uh, there are very familiar arguments that we've had on this program for and against. This time there was a lot of talk about literally tens of millions of dollars now in this bill going toward things like hardening of school infrastructure to school personnel, even um, mental health uh, assessments and counseling. D does that make a difference to you? The, the new parameters that they've put into the bill are, are mirroring what was passed in the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, Public Safety Act uh, and would apply it to private schools. But and, and while there may be some positive provisions, in my opinion, it's it's like putting lipstick on a pig. I think it's disingenuous to take a bill that makes us less safe. Right. Uh, allowing anyone without a background check, without any training, without any proficiency with a firearm to carry a firearm in the state of Florida. You throw a couple of school safety measures in there. Uh, you know, again, lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. So we had on this program one of your colleagues who is one of the sponsors of this bill, uh, Representative Randy Fine from Brevard County. And he his points that he made um, a couple of times during the course of our interview together was that right now there are people carrying firearms without permits and they're called criminals. And this bill doesn't stop them. The, the lack of bill doesn't stop them. So, so what's the difference? I, I think I'm characterizing what he said in, in a, in, in sort of a valid way. And my apologies to him if he thinks I'm not. But that was, you know, he made a point. Like th there are people who don't listen to laws. They're carrying permitless right now. Glenna, you know, under that logic, under Representative Fine's logic, why do we have laws at all? Right. Um, and, and actually what the what the concealed carry permit law has in place now is at least some level of requirement. Right. It's not terribly difficult to obtain one. I have a concealed carry. I had to go through an additional background check, show prof proficiency with a firearm. And I had to understand where I can and cannot carry that firearm. Right. That's the base level. That's the bare bones, if you will. So if they're saying that, well, there's not much in place now, so let's just do away with it. We should be doing the opposite. Let's have a real conversation about training those individuals who are allowing to carry uh, a firearm anywhere in the state. I think what is most damning to me about this bill is if you buy your gun from a private sale, right, uh, or the gun show loophole, there's no background check. If you uh, under this new law, there would be no background check for you to carry on your person. So you're going to see an increase in the number of people carrying on their person in this state. And the other states that have passed it have seen that become very problematic. Uh, states that have passed it have seen something like a 22 percent increase in the homicide rate. They've seen a 13 percent increase in officer involved shootings. Uh, the state of Florida, we like to talk about how we back our blue. Um, and we should support our law enforcement officers and we should listen to them on this issue because by and large, the officers on the street are opposed to this issue, just as they have been in the other states that have passed permitless carry. Uh, well, since you brought that up, I, I will let everyone know that we did not not recently, but when the bill was first filed, we did reach out to both the sheriff of Broward County and the police director of Miami-Dade. And so far, we have not heard either of them take a position on this bill. Um, and the stats that you raise, we've seen and, and there are, I suppose, are stats that there are on the other side and it's just a, a matter of parsing through the numbers and seeing what you believe there there are two million eight hundred and thirty one thousand concealed weapons permits in florida right now um senator lauren book and committee brought up how seven thousand permit applications were denied um is that a concern to you at all that is and that goes back to what we were talking about before right glennon there was at least something in place 
that prevented an individual that should not be able to carry a firearm in the state of Florida to, to prevent them from doing so. Uh, we're removing that. Uh, we're removing any requirement whatsoever and allowing basically a free for all. So back to your original question, you know, do I think or what do I think that impact would have had in the in the situation at MSD? I think we're going backwards. I think post MSD, you saw the passage of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Public Safety Act. That was a step in the right direction with proposals like permitless carry, like the proposal that came out last week to reduce the age back to 18 years old to purchase a, a long gun, you're, you're seeing us go back in time in the state of Florida and it's truly unfortunate. So the training aspect is really a, a very um, universal concern, even from a, a trainer, a gun safety trainer that we had worked with who was wearing his NRA shirt at the time, who is a huge Second Amendment proponent and a gun enthusiast who also was very concerned about the lack of training. That said, the actual training required right now under the permit is pretty perfunctory and not very much. And it really is the onus of a responsible gun owner to go and get that safety training and be a responsible gun owner. Why would a, why would a permit change that personal responsibility component? Sure. You know, look, if we have a problem with the current training, uh, maybe we should increase the training. Maybe we should make a standardized training program through FDACs, right? There are options there. Just doing away with it because it's a bare minimum isn't the right answer. In the state of Florida, you require 240 hours of training to do nails. You require 600 hours of training to, to do nails, hair. like manic manicure nails? Correct. To be a nail technician in the state of Florida, you need a license and you need 240 hours of training. To cut hair, you need 600 hours of training. If this bill passes, you need zero hours of training to carry a concealed firearm anywhere in the state. Well, I guess um, the argument to that might be that there are no nail salons or hair cutter requirements in the Constitution, and, and so that might be you know an argument there. Um, Jamie's Law, you are refiling. That would be named after Jamie Guttenberg, one of the young victims at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High. Um, that would require background checks for ammunition sales. What are your colleagues on both sides thinking about that this session? You know, it has been, um, I say i say an honor, but uh, unfortunately it was a massacre that brought us together. It's been an honor to work with Fred Guttenberg, uh, Jamie's father, uh, over the years on Jamie's Law. I have filed it for the last three years uh, in the legislature, and unfortunately it's never seen the light of day. And I think that's really problematic because when I look at something like Jamie's Law requiring a background check on on, on ammunition, that should be the low the low hanging fruit, right? Reasonable gun reform. I'm, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. You heard me mention I have a concealed carry. I'm not coming for anybody's guns. I just want to make sure the people that aren't supposed to have them and aren't supposed to have the ammunition for them, we don't make it easy for them to get it. Right. Well, right now, you go in to purchase a firearm. You, there's a background check. They, they verify who you are and that you're eligible to get it. But that same individual can walk into any store and purchase as much ammunition as they like. Uh, and no one would ever know whether they're allowed to actually carry that or not. Dan Daly, great to have you again. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. And like we keep saying to everyone, we are so watching what's going on in Tallahassee. Thank you. Thank you. All right, first, a building collapse prompted new condo safety law, and now criminal condo board members prompt new protection laws. A dive into that is now. The recent arrest of homeowners association members in the Southwest Miami-Dade Hammocks community and the money involved may have shocked a lot of people, but there are those who didn't find it shocking at all, who think condo boards and homeowners associations have too much power and too little oversight. Republican Representative Juan Carlos Porras is a freshman from Southwest Miami-Dade, shepherding a bill through session that aims to fix that. Juan Carlos, great to have you here, a freshman on this program. Thank you, Glenna. Thank you so much for having me today. Good to see you. So this bill, the Community Association Bill of Rights, um, looks like the big component is making board members potentially potentially criminally liable for things like theft and embezzlement of funds. But but wouldn't they already be criminally liable for that, as as evidenced by the arrests at the hammocks? Correct. And just to clarify, so the the laws that, that are currently in place that that the the members of the hammocks were arrested for were, were many RICO charges that that the state attorney has has had issues with um, in the past with with putting them in 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 court. But this this law 
um, actually provides more criminal penalties for associated related claims, especially for embezzlement of funds, for ballot tampering, for, for election fraud, and make sure we have the much added transparency and accountability that we've seen uh, that has been lacking in these homeowner associations and condos for, for years now. De detail that for me. When you say lack of yeah. transparency, what, practically speaking, what does that mean? What is not transparent? Right, absolutely. I mean, for years we've seen even financial documents for the most part and even bylaws. Many homeowner association residents or condo residents have no idea um, what is going on in their condominiums, what is the money being spent on. And as we've seen with the example of the hammocks, they even have, have denied the access to these records to even law enforcement and court officials. So we're making sure with this legislation that residents are can know what their money is being spent on. And if there's something criminal going on, that law enforcement and the right officials can, can get access to that. So there are components in, in the document that mandate kind of take away the power of homeowners associations to, to do certain things because the state is watching. So that mandate that um, homeowners have to be able to access things online, access the money. Um, where is there personal responsibility for a homeowner in there somewhere? <laughs> Correct. Well, obviously, you know, government can only do so much with this with with legislation. Obviously, there is still a huge responsibility on the homeowners and of the association to be involved and make sure that they hold hold their their boards accountable. But we want to make sure with this legislation that everyone has the correct tools in place to not only be able to contact, uh, you know, the state or law enforcement if there's illegal activity going on, but also have the tools to be able to address those concerns legally if if needed. You know, what I learned reading this bill is that more than half the people who live in Florida live under some kind of homeowners association. Mm -hmm. I think that's a staggering number. And yet you and three co-sponsors in the House are all representatives from Miami-Dade County. Is, is the, are the rules different here? What, what is going on in Dade that this is, um, is this a problem throughout Florida? Sort of ball, ballpark oh. how big this problem is. I would say this is a statewide issue, Glenna. You know, I've been very vocal on this subject um, as as ever since I've been elected, since representing the hammocks. Um, this has been a key priority for me. But ever since we've been on this issue, we my office has received calls and emails from all across the state, from the Panhandle to the Keys. And you've been you'd be surprised how many of these associations and residents are frustrated. They feel voiceless, and this and this re legislation really addresses most of those concerns and we're working with with our with our our leadership and, and our state attorney here in miami dade to make sure that these bad actors are, are are put behind bars you know one of the components of the bill that i thought were re was really interesting is that um no association funds may be used for attorney's fees i guess um that's meant to be a, a chilling effect on board members to think twice about how they comport themselves and their duties yeah, correct. So in, in my specific example, in my district and in, in the hammocks, you, you would see these these associations increase rates even 400 um, percent in some cases to to pay for the criminal attorney's fees um, that of, of which they were stealing funding that now we know of um, from their own residents. Because I, I think it's appalling that that as a resident, um, you are paying for the uh, attorney's fees of somebody that is stealing from you. So we wanted to make sure we address that. Allegedly, uh, allegedly excuse. stealing. <laughs> <laughs> allegedly, yes. Let me, um, I'm going to go off script here for just a moment and we have about a minute left together but I wanted to sort of you know we, we've known each other before you were elected and um, you are a freshman with a lot of mentors that are helping guide you from Miami-Dade especially a Republican Republicans from Miami-Dade that you've known a long time but you know I want to get a sense in this session there's a super majority a lot of things going down along party lines how much pressure now pressure's on how much pressure do you feel like you have to cast that vote along party lines, or do you feel like you can cast your own individual vote? Should it should it be different? Right. Well, Glenna, I mean, I've thankfully I've I've had the the blessing of being in this process for for a couple of years, not not as a representative, but as a legislative aide. Um, so I I know the process, you know, fairly well con compared to many of my freshman colleagues. Um, but you know. I, I feel no pressure whatsoever. I, I actually, you know, I, I agree with a lot of the policies that are going on right now, but I know for a lot of my uh, for my colleagues in much, you know, more difficult districts or much more different mindsets that, you know, they're willing to to have that, have that communication with leadership and, and with the right people. But, you know, 
thankfully I don't I don't think I have a lot of those concerns. <laughs> Thanks for uh, dancing with me there for a second. You know, you're always you're always welcome here, always treated with respect and love, and I so appreciate you um, starting your career off on television with this week in South Florida. We'll see you. We'll see you many times back. I hope. Thank you, Glenna. All right, up next, an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with Vice President Kamala Harris. She made a visit to South Florida and interviewed with our D.C. bureau chief, and that is next. Important conversations about climate change came to ground zero for climate change this week at the Aspen Ideas Climate Conference, Miami Beach. Vice President Kamala Harris was there and took some time for a conversation with our D.C. Bureau Chief, Ben Kennedy. We're here to talk about climate change. What is your message to South Floridians on clean energy? Well, first of all, let's see the incredible opportunity in front of us. We are, we are starting a whole new economy around the clean energy. It's a clean energy economy. This is about the creation of jobs, good paying jobs. This is about an investment in our future. It's about an investment in innovation in a way that we are going to create things that the world will, will take advantage of. So it's exciting for that reason. It's exciting because our administration has been able to put what we calculate to be about a trillion dollars that will hit the streets of America around these investments. And so it's not only about job creation, American manufacturing, innovation, it of course is about doing what we need around climate adaptation and resilience and clean water and clean air, which is so fundamental for obvious reasons. On Thursday, tomorrow, President Biden will announce his federal budget proposal. Yes. Could you give us a bit of a sneak peek? What impact would the plan have for right here in South Florida? Well, in South Florida, for example, we know we have a lot of seniors who, from the first days that they started working years ago, have been putting money into Medicare. And we will announce as part of the budget that we're going to extend Medicare um, by 25 years because we want to make sure that our seniors get the full benefit of their hard work and ensure that they have access to the health care that they need. And it's a fundamental value of ours, which is our very strong belief that access to health care is a right and should not be a privilege of just those who can afford it, especially when it comes to our seniors. This is President Biden's first budget proposal since Republicans took control of the House. Yeah. Can President Biden get bipartisan support on this plan? I believe we can get bipartisan support. I just look at our track record. For example, the work that we did on the infrastructure law, which is going to be about upgrading the, the roads and bridges right here in South Florida. Um, that was bipartisan work. The work that we did getting the first piece of smart gun safety law passed in 30 years was bipartisan work. So I remain optimistic that we can bring Democrats and Republicans together to craft a budget that meets the needs of the American people. Your visit comes one day after the first day of the Florida's legislative session. They're talking about revising the state's abortion bill. The bill would ban abortions after six weeks. Your reaction? I think that um, it, is, it is absolutely abhorrent that politicians would be telling women what to do with their own bodies. And let me say this, it is a foundational principle of our country that we believe in freedom and liberty and the ability of people to make decisions about their own life, the future of their family. And the idea that the government would be making those decisions for the women of America really flies against the values that we hold dear when we talk about freedom. Um, you know, when we, we want to talk about the vanguard of freedom, well, when you're taking away the freedom to make decisions about your own body, much less the freedom to be able to have access to the ballot box, the freedom to marry the person you love and be open about that, the freedom to learn America's history, I would say that this is not exactly a vanguard of freedom. I wanted to talk to you about 2024. President Biden says he intends to run. Have you spoken to the president about this and how close is he to making a final decision? You will know when he makes it. <laughs> But I will tell you in all seriousness, the president has said he intends to run, and if he runs, I'll be running with him, and for good reason if he decides to run for re-election. You look at the accomplishments that our administration has made under his leadership, and they are transformative and historic. You haven't seen the kind of progress on, for example, infrastructure 
building back up America's ridges, bridges and roads. People have talked about it. Administrations have talked about it. And remember that whole thing about infrastructure week? It didn't happen. But under President Joe Biden, we now have billions of dollars that are already starting to upgrade America's roads and bridges. We're now in the process of ensuring that all families have access and can afford access to high-speed internet, something that families around South Florida and around the country realized was a real problem in the height of the pandemic if you were trying to get your, your children to be able to get an education online. Our seniors understand they shouldn't have to go to the public library to have a telemedicine appointment with their doctor. They should be able to have and be able to afford high-speed internet at home so they in the privacy of their home can talk to their doctor. These are the kinds of successes we have achieved. And there is still more work to do and, um, and I believe that when we look at the accomplishments of Joe Biden that history, if not the, the present moment, will show that he has been a bold leader and that our administration is actually meeting the needs of the American people. If President Biden is reelected, he'll be 82 years old. What do you tell people who think he's too old? I say look at the accomplishments and you will see bold leadership. I just met with a group of young leaders here on the climate crisis and they are talking about how they are going through such emotional and 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 and, and psychological angst around this issue. They're thinking about could they have children? Can they bring children into the world in a moment where we're looking at these extreme crises around the climate issue? Because of Joe Biden's leadership, looking forward, being bold, we're going to put a, a trillion dollars into this issue in a way that's going to fast forward where we need to be. You t look again at bold leadership around something like high-speed internet. You look at bold leadership around what we need to do to create jobs in America, small businesses. We've created more small businesses in the last two years than in any two-year period in the history of our country. My final question for you, Madam Vice President. You have a little less than two years left in your term. What are some of the top one, two, three things you want to get done uh, in the next two years? Well, one, I want to continue to focus on what we need to do around the climate infrastructure, and that's about the adaptation and resilience. I look at, for example, the Everglades and what we need to do here in South Florida. We're going to be putting um, approximately $8 million into helping this region do what we need to do to deal with rising sea levels and preserve that beautiful aspect of, of, of the, the natural capacity of this area, the work that we are doing to promote and bring more capital to small businesses. I look at South Florida and the thriving small business community. A lot of the work I've been doing is about increasing access to capital for small businesses. And then, of course, the work that we're doing on a global level, the work that we have done bringing our allies together. I was just in Munich where we were bringing nations together around saying that America stands with our allies and we stand in defense of the importance of independence and sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is the work we're doing and we're going to continue to do it. To re-watch today's interviews or listen to the This Week in South Florida podcast, all you have to do is scan that QR code right there with your phone and it takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. And you know we are online 24-7, and you can connect with us so easily on social media. Find, follow, reach out at Glenna WPLG. That's Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. As always, we thank you so much for being here with us this hour. And remember, please do keep in touch.